Welcome again to Worship at Home. We're meeting Sunday here in the building, but we're also continuing online. So whether you're new joining us today online or you're returning and you're just visiting us online instead of in person, would you please contact us and let us know you're here? Go to ainsworthfree.org in the contact page and let us know that you joined us today. We'd love to have a conversation with you. I want to end this series in chapter 4 of Jonah titled Mission Drift. Chapter 4 is the conclusion of the book of Jonah and we'll see God loving and Jonah whining. Jonah lays out his complaints against God and God illustrates his love and his mercy to Jonah. We'll end with four lessons about God's love and mercy that really capture chapter 4 and the message of this book. They're lessons for our church, they're lessons for God's people, and no matter where you are in your faith, they're lessons for you. Let's worship God together today. Good morning, online church attenders. I would like to share a passage of scripture with you, if I may, before we start our service this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, it's just a comfort to read verses such as this, I guess, before we begin our service, to know that we have a foundation and it is not moving. We have a foundation that knows the past as well as the future. And we also have a God that knows his children and knows them dearly. In fact, he seals them with his seal. The Holy Spirit, one of his, the Holy Spirit's ministries that he carry out is a sealing ministry that we are sealed, our souls are sealed until the day of redemption. So he knows us, he loves us, and he knows where we're going, and he knows how everything's going to turn out. So just want to share that passage with you this morning. During these changing times, we serve an unchanging God. And what a comfort that is to my heart, and I hope it is to yours. Would you pray with me this morning? Our gracious Heavenly Father, God, you are the sustainer. You are the creator. God, you are a powerful, almighty God. Um, we just uh, stand in awe at the creation around us. We stand in awe at the Bible that we can hold, that we can read, and the message that it carries, Father. The prophetic message, the convicting message, the guiding message, the directing message that it carries for each and every one of us, Father. And Lord, I just again thank you for the, the tool, the sword that we carry, Father. And Lord, I just again thank you for the um, omniscience, the omnipresence, the power that you have to know um, what happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future, Father. Lord, I just look to you. We look to you during this time, Father, of, of um, change and misdirection, Father. Lord, we just uh, pray that you will be working before us, God, just working in our hearts and our lives, helping us to be soft and moldable to your plan and your will for our lives. And as we see directives and directions change, Father, may we know that you are in it and you are a part of it. And you are using it, Lord. So as we look the look ahead to what lies ahead for, for us as believers and us as a church, and I just pray, Lord, that you will be doing a work in, in our hearts and preparing us for what is to come. And I do thank you, Father, for sealing us with your Holy Spirit, Father, knowing that we are your children from now to eternity, Father. And we can rest in that, Lord. I thank you for what that does to my heart. And I just again thank you and praise you, God, for the power that you contain, the the word that we can hold in our hand, and the Holy Spirit we have in our heart, Father. Lord, I just again thank you for the difference that you make when you come into our heart and come into a life, Father. May you receive all glory due your name. We just again thank you for this service. And uh, Lord, may you be glorified and honored in a way that only you deserve, Father. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I hold when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I
shape no longer has a place to hide I'm not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken I won't be shaken There's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name Power in your name There's power that can break off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave Resurrection power that can save There's power in your name Power in your name My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand Well, today is the exciting conclusion of the book of Jonah, chapter 4, where a large plant grows overnight. Well, several weeks ago, I asked you to reconsider Jonah, to read it again as if you've never read it before, and then to join the circle of ancient listeners from the mid-8th century B.C., who for over a hundred years had been oppressed by pagans, evil people, wicked nations, barbaric, voodoo-loving, immoral Assyrians. Well, Nineveh was a spectacular city where Jonah was called to go. It had over 1,500 towers, walls up to 200 feet high in some places, and over 120,000 people. But the book is not about Nineveh, nor is the book about the great fish or about Jonah. The book is really about God. God's love and his mission. And for any sensible Hebrew person, it was completely unreasonable to go on this mission to Nineveh. But to any sensible Hebrew person, it was also unreasonable to run from God. So, so far in chapters 1 to 3, everyone obeys God. The sailors, the wind, and the waves in chapter 1 and 2. The fish obeys God at the end of chapter 1 and the end of chapter 2. All the Ninevites obey God in chapter 3 as they repent. And finally, in the beginning of chapter 3 is when Jonah begins to obey. But in chapter 4, we find that his heart is unchanged. Well, we'll see in this chapter Jonah's complaints itemized and God's love clearly illustrated. Then we'll conclude this study of this book with four lessons about God's justice and God's mercy. If you'll join me in reading your Bibles in Jonah chapter 4 and read along, I'll be reading all 11 verses. Jonah chapter 4. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, 
slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what happened to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort, and Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint, and he wanted to die. And he said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, Jonah said. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You've been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And I should not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. This is the word of the Lord from the prophet Jonah. For this week, I've worked on what I thought would be an appropriate ending for four weeks of awful puns about Jonah. And chapter four focuses on a large plant, or in some translations says, a gourd. Well, chapter one, we saw that the mission was what Jonah found hard to swallow. In chapter 2, we found Jonah a bit down in the mouth. In chapter 3, after being vomited up on the shore, Jonah's feeling a bit chunky. And now, after Jonah argues with God in chapter 4, Jonah gets squashed. Well, going along with the whole whale theme of the book, every time Jonah opens his mouth, he's either blubbering or spouting off. Well, we turn our attention now to finishing this book of Jonah in chapter 4. In verses 1 to 3, we see Jonah's complaints itemized. Jonah finally lays it out. He disagrees with the mission. He apparently always did at the beginning. He never really changed his mind, even though after the whole big fish experience, he did go to Jonah, as God said. But what Jonah had feared at the beginning is exactly what God did. God was, in fact, as Jonah recites, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. And Jonah, that's exactly what Jonah didn't want. And he was angry enough about it to want to die. Well, 800 years later, in the first century, not much had changed when Jesus came to earth. Jesus was rejected by the Jewish leaders mostly because he loved people that they didn't the lame, the poor, the tax collectors, the woman caught in adultery. You see, the focus of what the Jews didn't like was the Gentiles. They even rejected Jesus' miracles. Now, previously I read from Matthew chapter 12, a little bit longer version of what Jesus said, but today I wanna to look at Luke chapter 11. We're right before the event where Jonah quotes, uh, uses Jonah in his quotation. In chapter 11, he'd been casting out demons, and the Jews accused him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. In his reply, Jesus quoted Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, a house divided cannot stand against itself. That was a joke. Lincoln actually quoted Jesus, but not many people remember that today. But even the house divided that cannot stand did not convince the Jews that they, in fact, had misunderstood the purpose of Jesus' miracles. Or better, they refused to believe it. Well, Jesus ends this section in Luke eleven twenty-eight 28 by saying, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey. Who hear the word of God and obey. And then he goes on in verse 29 to say this, 
As the crowds increased, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. Verse 31, the queen of the south will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Well, Jesus clearly spoke about Jonah as a historical person, as the queen of the south. And the same problem from the days of Solomon was the same problem in the days of Nineveh, was the same problem that Jesus encountered in that day. Two simple truths. One is this, Jonah should have known because Jonah heard. God reveals his character, his love for all, and the proof that Jonah knew this was that he recited it back to God in these first three verses. He knew exactly what God was like. He just didn't like it. He wanted it to be his way. The second simple truth is that Jonah should have obeyed. He should have acted accordingly with the truth that he knew. Just as Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. See, people are asking today, not just, is it true? They don't just want the information or even the proof. They want to know, does it work? They want to see it. They want to see your good works so that you will glorify your Father in heaven. Well, Jesus actually told several parables on the same subject. In Matthew 18, he gave, told the parable about the unmerciful servant. And before he taught about forgiveness and reconciliation in Matthew 18, he talked about forgiving, being forgiven by God, and so forgiving others. Then he put three parables together in another place, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost sons. We talked about this parable the last couple weeks, where really the parable of the loving father is the loving father who forgives his son, the younger son, and also offers that to the older one who resents his mercy. So are you one of the sons? Either the younger one running away on the outside or the older one running away on the inside, resenting God's mercy like Jonah in this second half of the book. Or are you Jonah in the first half running away on the outside like the younger son? or in the second half, running away on the inside like the older son. Either way, rejecting God's love, not embracing who he is, or are you on his mission of love and mercy for all peoples? Well, Jonah is especially written to believers. It's about who you exclude. It's about who you include. It could be overt or it could be subtle who you ignore, who you show no interest in, who you believe deserves God's judgment or does not deserve his forgiveness, who is worth reconciling with, and who can you afford to despise. For example, someone says something or does something to offend you, Instead of taking Jesus' instruction in Matthew 18 and going to that person, you write them off and you leave them out of your circle. Often it's misunderstood the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness is saying that you don't owe me anything. I release you from any debt to me as a result of your sin against me. But reconciliation is a restored relationship. Too many times we're contented to say, I forgive you, you don't owe me anything. But unlike Jesus who forgives, he also reconciles and restores the relationship. There are cases where restoring a relationship is not possible in this life because restoration depends on both parties. 
forgiveness can be released. You don't owe me anything. We had a neighbor in Michigan whose husband was murdered, a man who tried to steal his wallet and ended up shooting him. And he died in the parking lot of a fast food store. She went to the trial and she read a statement offering him the salvation, hoping that he would come to know Jesus, the only forgiveness for having done wrong in this life. She offered her forgiveness, but as he was in prison, reconciliation was not possible. Ten years later, through a fluke, there was a retrial. She went through the trial again and again read him the statement, two times offering him the forgiveness and especially the reconciliation with God. I don't know whether he ever took it, but at great cost, our friend offered the love that God offers to each one of us. Verses 1 to 3 is Jonah's complaints. They're itemized for us. Jesus wants not only to forgive, but he wants to restore a relationship with him for all peoples, even people who are far from God and running away from God, even people who are running away from him on the inside, like Jonah in chapter 4, rejecting God's love and his mercy, not applying it to their own lives. See, Jonah knew God, he heard God, but he failed to act on it. He was still holding out. Well, after Jonah's complaints are itemized in the first three verses, verses 4 to 11 is God's love illustrated. Verses 4 and 5 is a leading question. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? And the way the question is structured, it implies that the answer is negative. No, it is not right. In verses 6 to 8, then, he gives an object lesson, causes a leafy plant to grow up. It's undeserved grace for Jonah. It gives him shade and it makes Jonah happy. In verses 7 and 8, it tells that God also provided a worm, an east wind, and blazing sun to take away the shade that he had given that Jonah had not merited. But Jonah's response, it would be better for me to die than to live. Then in verse 9, God repeats the question again. Is it right for you to be angry a second time? And Jonah insists, it is. He said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Verses 10 and 11 then. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? He adds the twist, and also the animals. Does Jonah have no concern for any of these people or anything God created? Or was he so fixed on the justice of God for the people that Jonah believed observed them? The book ends with an open question. For everyone to hear and for each one of us to answer. Are we concerned about the Ninevites? About the people who we believe do not deserve God's grace? Well, let's follow Jonah's death wishes for a moment throughout the book. In chapter 1, he's going down to Tarshish. He's going down in the ship. He's going down to the bottom of the ship. And then he ends up in the fish going down to the bottom of the sea, even further down. He'd rather die than live in a place with God's mercy for the pagans. In a place where God did not judge the people Jonah believed should be judged and that becomes clear in chapter 2 in his prayer. When Jonah had told the, the sea captain to throw him overboard, he'd rather die than have God show mercy to the people he believed didn't deserve it. In chapter 2, he called on God in a prayer. And now the situation's reversed. Jonah can't live without the saving mercy of God for himself. And in chapter 3, Nineveh repents. And Jonah says, this is wrong. I would rather die. 
And in chapter four, the plant comes up and then it dies. And Jonah says exactly the opposite again. It would, I would rather die than be in a place without God's mercy to me. And God asks, is it right? And Jonah says, yes, I wish I were dead. You see the back and forth in Jonah's life clearly defining that he expected God's mercy for himself and God's judgment for his enemies. So the question for you and me is this, in what ways has God shown you his mercy? Upon whom might you expect his judgment? For who are you willing to show mercy? Like Jesus said to the seven churches, let him who has ears let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, after seeing Jonah's complaints itemized in verses 1 to 3, and God's mercy and love illustrated in verses 4 to 11, I'd like to end with four lessons that I believe capture this chapter and the message of the book of Jonah. There are four lessons about God's justice and his mercy. So we recall as we look through all four chapters that this book of Jonah is really not written particularly for outsiders. It's about people who need God's mercy, not sure it's real, and turn to him to receive it. But Jonah was really written for God's people. It was written for insiders, people who assume that they're worthy, People who know exactly who God should judge and why they should judge them or why he should judge them. The application to ourselves is straightforward. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a family member or even a fellow believer to whom you should say, why should I love you? Why would God give you mercy? Why should I give you mercy? I've assigned God's justice and God's judgment to you. Well, Jonah makes it clear that you don't get to do that. Simply put in 1 John chapter 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. So lesson one, God's justice and mercy is a matter of life and death. Throughout the book of Jonah, we'll see that it's life and death for the sailors. It's life and death for the Assyrians. It's life and death for Jonah. And it's life and death for you and me. This is not a trivial matter. It's one that many people stumble over God's justice and his mercy and his right to give them to the people to whom he decides. It's a matter of life and death for you and for me. The second lesson, God's justice and mercy, is a call for personal repentance. It was for the sailors and the Assyrians. It was for Jonah. It was for the Pharisees in Jesus' day. And it still is for you and me. Not only to know God's word, to hear it as Jonah did when he recited it, but also to live it from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, whether it's going on God's mission or accepting his mercy, to live it out and align our thoughts and our words and our actions with God's. So God's justice and mercy is a matter of life and death. It's a call for personal repentance. And thirdly, God's justice and mercy is our missional opportunities. They're missional opportunities. Just like it was in the days of Jonah. God is often at work in a storm. He's often at work in the bad things of life, the grace that's removed, or the challenges that you face. Even in this time of the coronavirus, God is at work. And it's probably less about the disease itself. It's less about the politics. It's less about the things that concern us. And it's more about God's mercy and love for all people to realize that we're not in control, no matter how much we've advanced in technology and in all the things that we have and the comforts that we have around us, God reminds us that we're not in control. And even those who suffer the losses in this life have another opportunity to rethink 
their relationship with God. God's justice and mercy is a missional opportunity. Like Jonah, we could be focused on the judgment of other people and or the mercy that we deserve. But instead, God is focused on his mission from the beginning of the book to the end. So the fourth lesson, which is the central focus of the book of Jonah, is that God is the subject of worship. He's the one who we worship more than anything that he created. His purpose is to transform our view of history, of current events, even of one another, and especially of the future. Dr. Robert Weber, the book about worship, put it this way, worship remembers and enacts and lives out the story of God. We sing, preach, and enact at the communion table the wonders of God, who as the subject creates, redeems, makes all things new. This worship involves the mind, it evokes the emotions, and engages the body and all the senses. See, living in God's story impacts us, the objects of God's love and his mercy. Our true worship is to tell and act on how God as the subject rescues the people of the world, the objects of his love. In worship, God shapes us, the objects, into the image of his son so that we offer our lives to God by living unto his death, in other words, dying to sin, and living unto his resurrection, in other words, rising to new life in the power of the Holy Spirit. See, the book of Jonah is about your life with God at the center the most important decision of your life, a decision you can make one time by saying, I realize, God, I've done wrong. I've rebelled against you. I'm worthy of judgment. But instead, I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin, to rise again, to have victory over death, and to give that victory to me for this life and for eternity and then to commit to follow him, to live in what we know about God. The first day, but also every other day, we need the gospel every day. We need to live in the gospel and offer the same mercy we've received to others who God loves. So it's time to choose which one is for you. Will you hold out on God's love and his mercy? Claim it for yourself alone, or will you join in on his mission? Will you worship God, or you worship something that he created? See, God's mission is to love the least and the lost, and to love one another in his name. Is this your mission? I pray that it is. Join me in prayer. Let's ask him to do that in our hearts today. Father, we worship you. We need you not just for the first time to worship, to pray a prayer of confession, a prayer of repentance, a prayer of belief in your son Jesus Christ, and a prayer of commitment. But we need to renew that vow each day we need to live in that vow and not like Jonah, slip away from understanding the mercy that you've given to us, to shy back from the mission to love those who are far from you and to love one another. Father, we have every reason to receive the grace you've given and freely give it to others. I pray that even now, you would break into our hearts and our thoughts. You would invade our church and our circle of friends, that we would renew our vows to you 
and that we would answer the question of the book of Jonah. Yes, your ways are right. Yes, we submit to you. Father, we worship you for your grace and your mercy. And in that worship, we thank you that you've given us your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. This is how we know, this is how we know what love is. Just one look at your cross. This is where we see, this is where we see how love works, for you surrendered your all. And this is how we know that you have loved us first, this is where we chose to love you. you in return for this life that you give for this death that you have died love amazing so divine we will love you in reply this is how we know how we know what love is just one look at your cross and this is where we see this is where we see how love works for you surrendered your all and this is how we know that you Worshipped and adored For you so loved the world That you gave your only son Love amazing, so divine We will love you in return For this life that you give For this death that you have died Love amazing, so divine Well, the message of the Bible is clear. And the message of Jesus throughout the Bible and throughout his teaching and throughout the life of the church, God's justice and his mercy are a matter of life and death. They're not optional. They're a call for personal repentance. And God's justice and mercy are mission opportunities. 
And finally, God is the subject of our worship. So whether you're running from God on the outside, denying his control of the world and of your life, or whether on the inside, rejecting his mercy for others and claiming it for yourself, or calling judgment upon others, thinking that you yourself are deserving, God's grace and his mercy are pursuing you now. If there's any way that I could help you grow in your faith, I wish you'd contact us and let us know today is an opportunity to get right with God. It may be just a simple prayer to begin a relationship with God, but it also can be a returning prayer to realign your heart with what God loves. That prayer will have an eternal impact on your life. I want to end with the words of 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Amen. Thank you for joining us.